Um, one of the things that, uh, that, that kind of I, I always remind myself of as we walk this out, it's easy to judge people on their part of the journey because you're judging them from your part of the journey. Mm -hmm. So you can look at where people are on the, on the road, to, say the road of the faith, for whatever you want to call that. And you can say, well, I don't know about the way they think and the way they dress and the way they act and what they're doing and what they're saying. But you're up here. Or maybe you're back here. You just think you're up here. And the road's twisting and it's misty between you and them. And you think you're ahead of them and maybe you're behind them. Point is, you're not where they are and they're not where you are, but you're on the same journey. We're on the same road. It reminds me of the moment when the disciples said to Jesus, Hey, we saw a guy today casting out devils in your name, but he's not part of our group, so we rebuked him. And Jesus said, don't ever do that. If a man's not against me, he's for me. And it was, it's a sort of way of saying, just because they're not walking holding your hand doesn't mean they're not walking this road. Yeah. So get off of their back because if they're not actively fighting us, Leave them alone. Let them walk their journey. And it's kind of like if, you know, it, I don't know how many Israelites came out of Egypt. Some historians, some scholars say three million. That seems a bit excessive to a, for a population to have grown to three million in that time span. But okay, let's say there's a million, whatever. That's a lot of people moving in a relatively straight line through a wilderness. Now imagine what the view was from person number 100,000's point of view, and then imagine what the view was from person number 900,000's point of view. And if you had asked the person way up front, hey, what's this thing all about? They would have given you a whole different horizon than the guy way back here. So just because someone has a different perspective than you doesn't mean they're not on the same journey. They just may not be walking in the same spot on the road that you are. I understand tonight that you may not be walking in the same spot on the road that I am, I don't presume that I'm ahead of you. It's too misty and the road's too curvy. You may be ahead of me. Odds are I'm ahead of you on a few spots in the journey and you're way, way ahead of me on other spots in the journey. If we can get to that concession, we can get along as human beings. We don't matter what denominations and religions and faiths we are. We've segmented far too much. We're gonna get into that a little bit tonight, but we've put people in boxes and we've built fences around them. And that isolates them and that makes them disqualified for what we perceive to be truth. It demands that they get out of their box and get into ours before they find anything with the Lord. I don't know if anything could be less loving. I don't know if anything could be more judgmental. I also don't know if anything could be more detrimental to the family of man than the constant building of fences around people whose views we cannot possibly comprehend. And I think we, we sometimes need to take inventory on where we are in the theological journey, lest our growing theology start to exceed our ability to love. So what I mean by that is you can get a head full of theology, we got all these verses and principles and scriptures and ideas, and start to use them to shape what you think about that person and that group. And your heart of love then comes in second place to your head of theology. So here's what I believe about them, or here's, we do this a lot with prophecy. We've become such, and I do put air quotes, and they're big fat air quotes. We have become such experts on Bible prophecy that we've lost the ability to actually prophesy into people's lives because we've so segmented people off into camps and categories for the way the world's going to end that we can't speak into the world they're living because we've already determined where they're going to go when this all comes down. And I think because we've done that, We've put theology above love. I, I, when I started three minutes ago saying this to you, I didn't have a really landing spot for how we were getting into this text, but I always just kind of trust, especially at the top of these meetings, I just kind of trust where those openings are going to go, having wrestled out the material. Um, and one of the things that, that um, that I want to get into tonight is, is that idea that the law can never trump the love. Um, the idea of what I'm supposed to do, what's required of me, even to the point of I can say, the Bible tells me so. And yet, if I cannot love while I maintain that 
theology, then that theology should bow at the altar of love, not my love bow at the altar of my theology. And I think for too long, the church has literally had those two things backwards. Theology has trumped love and mercy. Jesus came along and was completely cut off by the scribes and the Pharisees. And we might say, why? Why was Jesus so argued against? Because Jesus flipped the paradigm. He accelerated and elevated love above an understanding of theology. And we are so unaccustomed to people living that way and walking that way and, and, and performing that way that in, and I've said this before, and most people don't even believe this. It rarely gets amen. I don't care. I think it's true anyway. And that is if we got in a time machine and we went back and we hung out with Jesus and we could actually speak Aramaic and knew what was going on, in a lot of ways, we wouldn't like him either. Because the first time that he was confronted with what he's supposed to do according to Torah and he didn't do it, we'd go, if you're not going to follow the Bible, I'm not going to follow you. And uh, never more exemplified than in that famous eighth chapter of John when you cast the woman caught in the act of adultery at his feet and say, Moses said we stone her, what do you say? Hey guys, that's the equivalent of chapter and verse. Yeah. Bible says this. Here's the book, here's the chapter, here's the verse. What do you say we ought to do? The correct answer according to Modern Christian theology would be whatever the Bible says, book, chapter, and verse is exactly what we're going to do. And yet here's Jesus going, love trumps what it is you think you should do. Now you go, well, how do I interpret that when I read my Bible? Don't change the rules. Love trumps everything you've ever heard. It trumps everything you can possibly imagine. That's what John's little letter is trying to do. That is the core of 1 John. He watched a man love like he had never seen a man love. That's why he opens the book with, we handled him, we saw him, we heard him, we felt him. He says, this guy was real. Now, why do you need to say that? Maybe you need to say it because people can't imagine that Jesus was actually real. But maybe you need to say it because people can't imagine a human being like that was actually real. That anybody could stand in the face of their enemies and love them and not fight back when they had the opportunity to fight back and not use their power to crush, but instead to lay their life down. It's off the charts, that 13th chapter of John. It's off the charts that he, knowing what was ahead of him and knowing what had been put into his charge, stood up and wrapped his waist with a towel and knelt in front of his disciples and washed their feet. It's the opposite of what you're supposed to do when you realize what you are and what you have. And yet that's Jesus and there's not a greater definition of love and I can't top it. And I try every week to give you yet another glimpse, another color, another side to what love looks like. And I just keep circling back to watch that man work, watch Jesus at his best. And I was going to say watch Jesus at his worst. Even G I don't know what Jesus at his worst looks like, but it would out love us. <laughs> that, that, I know that it would give us an example of what that looks like. So. Let's read the last couple of verses of 1 John 4. Tonight I subtitle this, The Burden is Light. That's a phrase that really comes from the Gospels. And you'll see why we're going to use that this evening because it correlates pretty perfectly to something that John's going to say in the fifth chapter. But I want to lap over a little bit. We, we stopped last week at the end of 4, but I want to lap 4 and 5 just a little bit and because 5 is really our focus tonight, the first several verses. But to do that, let's get a little bit of context. Here's 1 John 4, 20. So we go 20, 21, then 5, 1. Just boom, 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 three verses in a row. If someone says, I love God and he hates his brother, he's a liar. He who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Our earliest Greek translation of 1 John 4 does not pose this. Well, first of all, time out. No Greek puts question marks. We're always guessing with question marks. They didn't use punctuation in the Greek. So we only put the question mark because... The English has, how can he love God? But the earliest Greek doesn't say, how can he love God? The earliest Greek that we have found says, he can't love God whom he has not seen. So basically, it's not asking you the question, how is it possible? It's, he's saying it's impossible. It's not just a question of can you. No, you can't do it. So if you say you love God, but you hate people, then don't say you love God. The reality is you can't love a God you haven't seen if you can't love the man you can see. And I'm going to deal with that in a second. We're going to get rid of the question mark as well because it's not possible. The question mark insinuates that maybe you could argue your way into it. You can't. It can't be done. 
And that's the point. This commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ. Now this is where five begins, but you'll notice it's really the same thought. So maybe it's not the best chapter break. I'm not smart enough to know where the chapter breaks would be better, but whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him, who begot also loves whom is begotten of him. You got to break it somewhere and it's all a love passage. And so that's where it is broken. But before we really dig into the body of that, let me deal with that. How can we love the invisible, but not love the visible? How could we love a God we cannot see? Again, the, it's not really a question. We can't. So let's say it that way. We can't love a God we can't see if we won't love a man we can see. And John is so bold as to say, if you claim you love God, but you aren't loving people, you're really just lying. So I would say, who are you lying to? Well, the obvious answer is you're lying to yourself by claiming that you love a God that is invisible when you can't love the visible. And so that got me to thinking about loving the invisible. And I don't think we have trouble loving an invisible God because in reality, we create the invisible God in the image we want him to be. And that's what makes him easy to love. So we go, well, you can't see God, but here's what I wish God looked like and moved like and felt like and act like, oh, I love him. And really what happens when we fall in love with the invisible God at the expense of our visible neighbor, we're simply falling in love with the God that looks like us. It's a heavy dose of self-love. It's that we go, boy, God, we're not like those other people, are we? We're not like that guy I can see over there. Look how he acts. Look how he dresses. Look how he talks. Look what he does. I got trouble loving him. Don't we, God? Don't we have trouble with him, God? Don't we have an issue with the way he's acting, God? And we start to project onto God everything about us at the expense of our neighbor because he visibly has issues that he visibly won't change. And so we run back to the invisible God. And John calls us on it and goes, don't ever again say that you love a God you can't see when you you don't love a man you can see, you're lying. Who are you lying to? You don't have to worry about lying to God. He knows the truth anyway. It's yourself you lie to because you've created a God that doesn't exist. That God, that, that God does not have a place. Now, that, go back because I want to I do this first. This commandment we have that we who love God must love his brother. Whoever believes Jesus is the Christ is the one born of God. So John drops in the qualifier and says you can talk about loving God you can't love the man you can see. You claim to love the God you can't see. The truth is you don't truly love the God you can't see because if you had Jesus the Christ, you would love because you don't get to create Jesus in your image. We touched him, saw him, handled him. He was the real deal. Now you can say what you want about the God you create, but you can't make Jesus act like you. You have to act like Jesus. See the difference? And so as long as you can separate God from Jesus, you can create God in whatever image you want to. You can make him be the God you want him to be. This is why you can preach hellfire and brimstone all you want if you can stay out of the life of Jesus and just stay in the stories of the Old Testament. Even though you can't find the hellfire and brimstone text, but you can preach a God that you believe is on the war path because you don't yet have what he looks like as a man. If you stay away from Jesus, then you can create God back here in a thousand images. And that's really what's happening a lot of times in the Old Testament is God ends up landing in the image of the people writing the book. This is what we do when we go into a land. Thus saith the Lord. Jesus comes along and goes, don't attribute that stuff to my father. You know not what spirit you're of. That's what he one time said to his disciples who tried to do what the Old Testament did. Let's call down fire. That's how God treats people that don't like him. And Jesus goes, you don't know what spirit you're of. And I say, man, that was in the Old Testament. So what spirit was that of? Don't call it the Holy Spirit. It's a spirit, all right, but it doesn't belong to God. Maybe it's the spirit of man and his retributive justice being projected onto God, and then comes Jesus. And if you have Jesus, that shatters the image of what you get to make the invisible God out to be because you have to account for Jesus. You got to watch him, how he deals with people. And you got to struggle with how he handles his enemies and the commands that he gives you. And this is why when we get into John, and we're going to see this tonight, this is why when you start to talk about those commands, 
Don't run past Jesus to Sinai and honor Moses as if he's the command giver. Run to Jesus the Christ and see what he says. Why is this? Why does this always happen? Even in New Covenant circles, we're over here fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting about obedience, obedience, obedience. You don't have to obey. It's just faith. Oh, you don't have to keep God's commandments because the commandments are, are death. And all we're doing is quoting Moses. Well, if Moses was the pinnacle of commandments, then we're right. But he's not. There's Jesus. And every word that comes out of Jesus' mouth trumps everything anyone's ever said. And so when you find that what you're supposed to do as a follower of Christ is keep his commandments, quit running to Moses like Moses has something to say. Go to Jesus. Now, how do I know that's the case? Because that was Jesus at transfiguration. Hey, Peter, James, and John, come up here to the top of this mountain with me. Now, let me walk you through this because this is often missed. Because all we really think about when we go to the top of transfiguration is what we get to look like someday in glory. Look at us. We're going to shine like light. That is not what you're supposed to take away from that story. It has nothing to do with what you're going to look like when you get over in the glory land. Like who cares if in the new kingdom your clothes are white like a, the greatest wanderer, according to the Gospel of Mark. No one cares. What we should care about is that at the top of the mountain, Moses and Elijah show up. And Moses and Elijah are the law and the prophets. And Peter says what we all would say. It's good to be here. Let's make three little houses for you and Moses and Elijah. Now, why are you going to make three little houses? Because you don't want them to go anywhere. You know you found a guy you love in Jesus. No one ever loved like Jesus. Peter goes, who else are we going to go to? You have the words of eternal life. I've never heard a guy talk like Jesus. The best guy I've ever seen. He's the, he's the picture of what I wish I could be. But oh my gosh, there's Moses and there's Elijah. That's the law and that's the prophets. If we could put all three of these guys in three little houses, we could all come and visit them forever. Wouldn't this be great? And then remarkably, what happens is a voice comes out of heaven. And says, this is my son, hear him. And Moses and Elijah disappear. And Peter, James, and John open their eyes. And the only thing left on the field is Jesus. And it was God saying to us, do you know who you're supposed to listen to? Not Moses, not Elijah, my son. So whenever you hear in the New Testament, keep his commandments. Don't freak out. Hold Jesus' hand. It's his command you're listening to. So watch what comes out of his mouth. When he preaches the Sermon on the Mount, you should take notes. He's trying to tell you how to live in the middle of a world that doesn't think much of you. He's giving you not just advice, he's giving you instruction. When he tells you that the gate is straight and narrow is the way, it leads to life and few there be that find it, he's not telling you it's hard to get saved. He's telling you it's hard to follow his commands because it's going to be a whole lot easier to do whatever the world you want to. And the reality is, is his ways a little narrower than the way you were raised on. Because the way you were raised on is just do whatever comes easy. Do whatever makes you feel good. Do it the way dad taught you to do it. Do it the way your culture says do it. Do it the way you do it because you were raised out here, raised over there. You don't know me. You haven't seen anybody like me. And Jesus goes, that's the easy way. That's a lazy man's way out who does what he does because of his race, does what he does because of his dad, does what he does because of his culture, does what he does because of where he grew up. That's the easy way. You want the hard way? Follow Jesus. And Jesus says, man says, carry it one, you carry it two. Man smites you on the cheek, you give him the other one. You go, God, this is getting harder and harder. And that is the discipleship of following Jesus. And that's the command. That's when you insert Jesus into the story. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ. Now, I want to focus on this belief for a moment. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And then we're going to try to work our way and weave our way into some of these commands because I really want to work on the words that come out of Jesus' mouth a little bit tonight. Uh, next screen. To be, forgot, to be begotten of God, because this is, that was 1 John 5, 1, that, about being begotten of God. That's what it means to, to believe in Jesus is what it means to be begotten. So, to be the born of God is to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And I, I parenthetically say anointed, sent one, because we may or may not have a real concept of what messianic proclamation means because we don't think in terms of Messiah, but think in terms of the, smear, the sent one, the one who is brushed over by the Spirit. Um, by brushed over, I mean literally coated over by God. As a result, 
Expect to love people and be willing to do what God says, and this happens through Jesus. This isn't like, hey, you guys got to go out and do this. No, just expect that this is what's going to happen. If you're born of God, expect that loving people is what's asked of you. Don't say, oh, I got to go love. That's, that's a backwards approach. We're not, it's not a matter of I've got to go love. It's a matter of this is why I love. Right? And so where I'm failing to do that, I'm probably not understanding my inheritance. I'm probably not understanding my own spiritual DNA. We do that through Christ. Everything, by the way, through Christ. Any other litmus test for salvation is man-made because we tend to build parameters around truth. What I mean by that is the parameter that is given in 1 John 5, 1 is whoever believes in Jesus is born of God. Okay, let's start right there. Who's saved? Whoever believes in Jesus is the Christ is born of God. You go, well, I can believe Jesus is the Christ. Congratulations, born of God. And we would respond with, well, it's not that easy. You gotta do a lot more than that to get saved. Okay, oh, what, what do you gotta do? Okay, well, it just depends on what church you happen to walk in, by the way. <laughs> I mean, honestly, because I've been in a lot of them. And some of them have a really long list for what causes you to be considered part of the family. And some of them have a really short list. And some of them have a really well-defined list. And uh, some of them have a prayer that you pray to the Word. Um, some of them have classes you have to take until you are qualified. And some of them demand certain kind of baptism. Some baptisms are dunking. Some baptisms are cups of water poured over your head. Some baptisms are a splash of water on your forehead. Some baptisms are done in the name of Jesus. Some baptisms are done in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Some baptisms are done by the authority of Jesus Christ. Some baptisms are done in the name of the Father and His Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. I'm not even exaggerating. Those are like parameters of salvation. And then, once we're past the ceremony, and that's what it's become. Once we're past the every head bowed, every eyes closed, hands raised, nobody looking around, don't cheat. If you want to accept Jesus, say this prayer or come up here or whatever. Once we're past all that, and I'm not mocking, well, hey, I, we've, I've been down all those roads and I walk through that stuff as well. And, and I'm not saying there isn't a utility in tradition. It doesn't always mean it's the best, but it doesn't mean there isn't utility in it. But when you get past that, then there becomes parameter for who really got it and who didn't. You know, who really got saved? Who's on their way? Who's on their way out? And, and it starts to look like whatever we want it to look like. And it can be everything from the translation of the Bible that you're reading to the length of your skirt to the fact that you do or don't wear makeup or that you approve of tattoos or piercings. Um, and I'm just talking superficial stuff. Then there's all kinds of things about individual moralities. Things you will allow, things you won't allow, things you'll watch, things you won't watch, things you'll put into your body, things you won't put into your body, things you'll be a part of, things you won't be a part of. And we've even turned the litmus test political. You know, if you're one party, you can't be saved. If you're, if you're the wrong side, there's no way you can be following it. To the point of absolute absurdity considering that the early church who actually walked with Jesus said, if you could just land on him actually being the Christ, we'd call you part of the family. I mean, the biggest divider in the world in their, in their eyes was just believing that Jesus was who he said he was. If you could buy that Jesus was who he said he was, they went, well, you'd have to be born of God to believe that. You'd have to be born of God to believe that Jesus actually came from God, died, resurrected, and then went back to God. If you could buy that, hey, welcome in. We're glad to have you. And I wish we had a simplicity of the gospel that was a little closer to that, where then the parameters was not boxes of denominationalism, because I think what happens is, Disagreement leads to division, which leads to denominations or non-denominations <laughs> and segments of people who build little fences around truth and nobody else has got it. But John's landing point is not 20 lists of things and the way you got saved, but do you believe Jesus is the Christ? Don't say you do if you don't love people because that's what we ask of you. And where did he get that criteria? Well, he got it from Jesus who said, they shall know you are my disciples because you don't drink. 
because you refuse to watch certain movies. They will know you are my disciples because your church sign says this. No, he said, you know better. They're going to know your mind because you love, because it looks like me. He goes, that's what I did. So they're going to figure you must have followed that crazy Jesus if you learn loving people that don't love you back, because it's crazy to love people that don't care for you. I mean, anybody can love people that love them, but to love people that don't care for you, well, that's nuts. And Jesus goes, they're going to know you belong to me. And, and why do you think Jesus said they're going to, don't worry if they hate you, they hated me first? Why, why do you come up with that? Because, because look, it, it runs so counter to the system of this world that it's going to cause people a lot of pain to watch that sort of, Jesus wouldn't have called it Christianity, but let's do that. To watch that sort of Christianity, that we love that which is unlovable or doesn't love us in return. He goes, they're going to hate you for it. Goes, Don't worry, they hated me too. Because the system always hates that which stands in rebellion against the system. And it's a rebellious stance against the systems of this world to love in that manner. All right, back to that text real quick. You believe Jesus is Christ, the born of God. Everyone who loves him, loves him who's begotten of him. I got to really hurry. I, I, I think we've, yeah, we're on like the third set of <laughs> screens. We really got to speed this baby up. By this, we know we love the children of God. We love God. We keep his commandments. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. Let me give you an example of one of those. 323, you go back two chapters. This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus and love one another as he gave his commandment. That's a good place to start. So don't, don't run all the way back to Moses to try to figure out what commandments you've got to keep in order to follow God, because then you've got to jump over Jesus and go back to, don't do that. Start here. This is his commandment. Believe on Jesus, love one another. That's the commandment he gives. And really, that's the commandment Jesus reinforced because he goes, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, love your neighbor as yourself. He goes, on this hangs all the law and the prophets. On this hangs all of Moses and Elijah. So Jesus then becomes all of that in one person, which is why we don't put our faith in our ability to love God and we don't put our faith in our ability to love man. We put our faith in, the abil in Jesus and his ability to love us. And then in loving, receiving his love and loving him, we love the father and we love our brother. And where we struggle to love our brother is probably because we don't understand the love of our father as exemplified in Jesus. This is why when we specialize in works, performance, and effort, we're, we're left and we're right. But when we specialize in Jesus, we find the love of the father exemplified one man, Christ Jesus. All of that becomes ours. So focus on that last verse there from that first segment. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. Let me give you an example. All right. I already gave you one from John, 1 John 3. Believe on Jesus. Love. Okay. Not as easy as it sounds maybe. The believe on Jesus we say sounds easy, but then love of course becomes difficult. So let me give you another example of how what Jesus tells you trumps everything else. Here's Matthew 11. One of the most famous Jesus passages, but I want to focus in at the back half instead of the front, because we all love to quote, come to me all you labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. That's perfect. That's Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. This is Jesus talking, right? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. I always call this rest given, rest found. Um, one of these is your spirit. One of these is your soul. Your spirit man is that which has been implanted by the Father, he will live forever. Your soul is your, is your psyche. It's the seat of your emotions. It's how you think, it's how you feel. So notice that, come to me all you labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. So you come to Jesus, automatically your spirit man is at rest in Christ. But then, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, I'm gentle and lowly in heart, you'll find rest for this. So your emotions and your psyche don't automatically come to rest in Christ. They come to rest in Christ as you yoke together with Jesus. Now, this is an illustration lost on us because we don't yoke oxen any longer. But if you lived in an agrarian economy as Jesus did and you needed to put an ox in the field to work and you needed two ox to work together, you put a yoke on the, the neck of those ox so that they would stay together. They are not going two different directions. They're going the same directions. And two ox could do more than one ox, two horses together, two horsepower is more than one horsepower. And so the more the merrier and the more that the pulling is being done on both sides, the less both are having to work. So interestingly enough, Jesus involves the believer. Take my yoke on you and learn from me. 
as Eugene Peterson says in the message, watch how I do it. So as you go with Jesus, imagine that you're yoked together with him, you and him working the same row. Your spirit man is, is at rest because you've believed on Jesus as the Christ. That makes you one of the sons of God. Your, your soul, your psyche, your, your emotional man isn't always at rest. He's out there, man. Sometimes nut job crazy, right? All of us stressed out, freaking out, doubting our salvation, doubting everything. <laughs> but we link up with Jesus and we walk this out with him. And as we watch him do it, we realize that, he, that as we link with Jesus, we find the rest that we need. Now, what usually gets overlooked is verse 30. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. And this actually would have hit the ear odd because yokes aren't easy. They're not light, they're heavy. Those two oxen are working out there. And yet Jesus stops in the middle of it and says, the difference in me and the cow in the field is I'm doing all the pulling, which makes my yoke easy and my burden light. I'm doing the work. That's why it's easy. That's why it's light. If you let me do the work, I will do the work that needs done. And so next screen, to follow Jesus and to yoke together with Jesus are two different analogies. It's not always easy. I wanted to bring this up because I want to show you there is an ease, but that's not the last definition, okay? It's not the only definition. It's not always easy to follow Jesus because the road is narrow and there might be a cross waiting for you. I jumped the gun, got all excited and told you that a few minutes ago. That's okay. We just let that sort of reinforce what we talked about, about the, 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 the way is narrow. So there's a, an aspect of following him that's not always easy. But it is easier to yoke or to work together with him than to work alone. So when Jesus says, my yoke is easy, that doesn't mean that walking this out with Jesus, that, that doesn't mean that following Jesus is always easy. Following Jesus into his way of living is not always easy. In fact, Jesus says, you're going to pick your cross up and you're going to carry it up a hill. And that ain't easy. And some of you, he said, are going to die in the effort. And he said, a man might lose his life, but for my sake, that man will find his life. So following Jesus isn't always easy, but, letting, but working with Jesus, letting Jesus do the work in you is, is, is easy. It's getting your hands off of fixing you. It's getting your hands off of solving your issues. Following Jesus might demand that you turn the other cheek when you really don't want to turn the other cheek. But yoking with Jesus means you don't, you're not in charge of transformation spiritually. You're just believing that he's the transforming one, that he's doing the work in you. He's the one bringing gentleness in you. He's the one bringing kindness in you. He's the one bringing long suffering out of you. You're not squeezing and working in an effort to make that happen. You're receiving that because of what he is and because of what he has said. Think about context. It's king. I'm going to show you another one, but this screen will set me up for it. Jesus was a Jewish man living in a world of sacrifice, this is offerings, temple worship, and Torah observance. There's no way around that. That's the context of the world he is in, okay? He cannot say, I'm the sacrifice, you're the temple, the Old Testament's going to be replaced by the New Testament. You don't ever see Jesus say that in the Gospels. Hey, quit, you don't have to kill those lambs anymore, I'm the lamb. Um, oh, we don't have to go to temple. I'm the temple. This is why you see Jesus contextually trapped at times. It's like, why is Jesus going off to the temple? Well, because we're pre-cross, we're pre-resurrection. We understand that some things are culturally, Jesus is bound to his culture and his context. So he doesn't ask us to go. I use this as an example in a sermon recently. I go, don't assume that the words of Jesus don't apply to you unless it's so obvious that contextually it can't apply to you. Jesus once healed a leper, and the man came back and said, thank you. And Jesus said, now go offer up the rites of purification as Moses demanded. Now, if you take every word of Jesus serious, then what are you supposed to go do after a miracle happens? Go offer up the rites of purification as Moses commanded. You go, wait, wait, no, I don't have to do that. I'm not a Jewish man living in the first century under Torah observance. And so use common sense when you understand the context of which Jesus is in. So one of the common sense understandings of Jesus is that there's certain things he can't say, but he does hint at them. He does hint at being the sacrifice. 
and that there will someday true worshipers will not worship neither here or in this mountain for they will worship me in spirit. He does hint that there's going to be something better than a natural place to worship. He does hint that there's going to be a New Testament because you can't put an old garment, new patch on an old garment lest you rent the one and the wine spill out. All those things are, I hate to say the word code, but mm, they're kind of coded for there's something better coming. Keep your eyes on me. Watch for it. Now you're on the other side of it all. So you look back and you catch it. When he's at the well with the Samaritan woman and he goes, the true worshiper is going to worship the spirit and truth. You go, ah, Paul would agree. Your body is the temple. Don't you know that whatever you join yourself to, so it's not about where I go. You, we catch that. They don't catch that in their day. How can they? He can't come out and say it. In his time and in his context, he honors law keeping. Mosaic law keeping. But this is a very important conjunction. He challenges the status quo by showing them that it isn't always what they think it is. It isn't always what you purport it to be. Here's some examples. Watch this. Matthew 23, verse 1. Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, and he said, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That's both a compliment and a very subtly veiled insult towards the law because of what's about to happen, okay? So they're the top of the heap, Jesus says, legally. They're in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, observe it and do it. But don't do it according to their works. Uh Uh-oh, here we go. The twist happens. So Jesus goes, watch out. They're going to tell you what to do, but don't do it the way they do it because they're going to say it and then they're not going to do it. They bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. And so Jesus is admitting, watch out, because when people get a hold of this this side of the book, they're going to put more on you than you can stand. Matthew 11, 28, 29, 30, Come unto me, all you that labor heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. You find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. And my burden is not heavy, it is flippant, light, absolute opposite of the law, right? So according to Jesus, if you follow the Moses seat, you're going to get crushed. Now, why then, when you get to 1 John 5, would the real followers of Jesus be underneath the law? You you don't keep the commandments, you must not be a follower of Jesus. You're keeping Moses' seat commandments. Stop doing that. Keep the Jesus commandments, which are easy and light. I don't mean they're easy to always perform because that's turn the other cheek and that's doing to others you'd have them doing to you. But stop getting crushed beneath the load of Moses because Moses vanished at transfiguration, man, and he ain't coming back. This idea that there's two cosmic witnesses in the book of Revelation and Moses is one of them who comes back to come pounding the law at Jerusalem is such an insult to the finished work of Jesus Christ. I I am stunned that the church believes that somewhere Moses still holds the thunder. And if he could just get released, he'd come in slamming down the authority of God. Oh, and of course he'd be rejected because his message is too difficult. No, he wouldn't be rejected. He'd be celebrated. Are you kidding? If Moses came into our churches, we'd make a God out of him. It's all about what you do and who gets in and who gets out and who we accept and who we don't accept. And it ends up crushing the people trying to keep it because you can never live up to the demands of it. And then comes Jesus, the total opposite. He goes, it's not a heavy burden. I hand you my yoke is easy. My burden is light. It's why John would tell you that the burden is not grievous, that it's not difficult. They don't do them. They, fi- they give you heavy burdens, hard to bear, lay them on shoulders. They don't even move them with one of their fingers. They, don't, they can't possibly keep the commands that they lay on you. Now, I, I know there's a lot between Matthew 23, verse 4, and what did I give you? 13? So you read it on your own. I just want to give you some highlights of this passage. We're going to do this one more time as well. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. This is not cosmic heaven. After you die, the Pharisees are keeping you out of glory because you weren't able to keep the law. Jesus is showing that the way into the kingdom cannot be through Moses. 
Because they don't let you, you don't get into the kingdom of heaven through Moses. You don't go in and you don't let other people get in because you've put the standards of performance as the entry point. And performance will get no one in. None of us get in if the standards are performance. That's Jesus' point. The kingdom, Jesus said, is among you. This is why the Pharisees once asked Jesus, when's the kingdom coming? What's that going to look like? And Jesus goes, you ain't going to be able to see it. It's invisible. You've been making everything visible. But I'm here to tell you about a kingdom that's not visible. Here's two more. 23, 24, same chapter. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. What a sermon, right? That's a good opening line. You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. You want to know what really weighs a lot in the law? Justice, mercy, faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others done. You know what you really are? You're blind guides. You strain out a gnat and you swallow a camel. So you, you're, able, you're able to do the things thinking they are important while leaving alone the things that are really important. And look at what Jesus calls really important. Justice, mercy, and faith. Put those up. These are easily missed or as I say, inaccessible in an Old Covenant context. And they represent what is so much better about the New Covenant. And let me tell you why. Justice, mercy, and faith so often missed in our context because we have begun to think that in Old Covenant terms or legal keeping terms, these are a part of the message of the Old Covenant. But in reality, justice, mercy, and faith are not the booming messages of law-keeping. They are the underlying current that often gets missed in the law-keeping. They are the things that make it work that often get ignored. What Jesus called the weightier matters of the law, they're down there. But instead, you'd rather keep the stuff on the surface, the stuff that you can lord over other people. Let me give you my theory about justice. Here's one of the things that I find translation disturbing. The Bible word for justice is the same as the Bible word for righteousness. And in the Old Testament, the writers will use it intermittently. Sometimes it's righteousness, sometimes it's justice. But in the New Testament, the writers almost always called it righteousness. Why? There's no template, by the way. It's not as if in the Greek there's this little codicil that says, now in this moment it's righteousness, but in this moment it's justice. And you go, well, what's it matter? Oh, it matters big time, and here's why. Because the Western church world looks at righteousness as an individual thing. And we look at justice as a God thing. God's the one who brings justice. We're the ones that walk in righteousness by faith. But if everywhere in the New Testament it said righteousness, you changed it to say justice. Did you know you would not be breaching Greek protocol? You would simply be helping yourself understand something that Jesus and the early church understood. Like, for instance, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. No. Start over. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. These people are getting crushed, right? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after justice. They shall be filled. Blessed are those of you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. No. Blessed are those of you who are persecuted for justice' sake. Okay, try this one on. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Or maybe... I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. 
in that gospel is God's justice revealed from faith to faith. And justice matters when the boot's on your neck. And who does Jesus come for? The one who's poor in spirit, meek, wounded, brokenhearted. Don't spiritualize everything Jesus said he came to do. We, I was taught to do that as a Bible student. You know when Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord's upon me, for he hath anointed me to bind up the brokenhearted and set the captives free. Spiritualize that. You were captive to this. What if Jesus' first audience was not spiritual, but was physical? Because I came to take care of those of you who aren't being taken care of. I came to spread justice. Now, if you live in the old covenant world, justice was still demanded. The law was supposed to be the parameters by which that justice was meted out. But what happened is we took the law and started to believe that if we could keep it, we would somehow be closer to God than the people that couldn't. And we lost the meaning of what justice really was. I do want to show you how these pop up a little bit in the Old Testament as we try to land this tonight. Here's a for instance, Micah 6, 8, Old Covenant. Look at this. They're almost always at the very back of the, old, of the Bible, by the way, of the Old Testament. Almost always. I have a theory about that. Let me read it first. And I'll give you my theory. He has shown you, O oh man, what's good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God? Look at this, man. If you had wrote this down in Leviticus, you know what this would have sounded like? He's shown you, O oh man, what's good. What's the Lord require of you? We would have said like tithe, sacrifice, anointing oil, build the temple, take the land, possess. Those are deep way back there. Then as we get closer to Jesus, and here's what I think is happening. God's not changing his mind. I think man, as he's growing in his understanding of God, is starting to dig a little deeper past the surface and find the heart of the Father. And there's a few bright, shining lights in the latter pages of the Old Testament that really capture his heart. And they, they, they give you a glimpse you've never seen before. So Micah's one of them that goes, you know what's good? You know what the Lord really wishes you'd do? Be just, show justice, give people mercy, walk humbly with your God. Here's how the message says this. I like this. He, he's already made it plain how to live, what to do. What God is looking for in men and women, it's quite simple. Do what's fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. Don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. I like that. What about mercy? Next one. Oh, look at this. Hosea. That's another one of those little crispy books in the back of the Old Testament we never read. What, what, what's this mean? As we get deeper into the Old Testament, we're getting closer to Jesus. Look what happens. Revelation starting to pop up. I desire mercy. Hosea 6.6. 6. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. The knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. By the way, in a Jesus confrontation with the Pharisees, when they got mad at him healing people on the Sabbath, he quotes not Deuteronomy, not Exodus, not Leviticus, not Numbers, not Psalms. He quotes Hosea 6.6. 6. And he goes, I want you guys to go look this up. And the next time I see you, tell me what it means that I desire mercy mercy and not sacrifice. And three chapters later in the book of Matthew, they come to Jesus and he goes, did you look it up? You didn't. Cause if you had, you wouldn't be acting this way. Amazing to me that when Jesus wants to show the heart of God, he goes and pulls these little moments out of the latter part of the old Testament. Cause the truth is that's the justice. That's the mercy. That's the faith that God was always looking for that got shrouded over by the Moses seat by us being obsessed with the written commandment. Now, Paul would run as far as he could the other way and go, let me tell you what that written engraved in stones was actually the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation. Paul's bold. Paul's like, uh, I'm not going to play around with you. You go back to that, it'll kill you. <laughs> I think it will. If you stay there long enough, it'll crush you. That might not be the worst thing for you though. Because once you get crushed underneath the weight of that, all you're left with is, well, if God's a loving God, I'm going to have to do this by faith. I'm not going to be able to do this by performance. Some of us were down that road where we realized, man, I can't live this. And what was happening is our faith was getting choked out. Here's the last, here's the last of those three. Look at this. This is New Testament. I, just, I think Paul really gets this. Galatians 3.22. The scripture has confined everybody under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would after, afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor or our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. This is actually a terrible translation. The Greek here does not include these words. 
The law was our tutor. Get rid of this. The law was our tutor to Christ. Or the law was our tutor, get rid of this, until Christ is the Greek. It's not the law was our tutor to get us to Christ. It was the law was our tutor until we got Christ. Once we got Christ, we don't have a tutor anymore called the law. Why would we? We have Jesus. So when John says, follow his commandments, what commandments is he talking about? Don't jump Jesus and get to Moses. Listen to Jesus. You now have the tutor. Because what did the tutor of the law do? The tutor of the law 23, it kept me in guard. It kept the faith which would have to be revealed. In other words, I couldn't even walk by faith as long as I was walking in the law. Because the law doesn't demand my faith. The law says thou shalt not kill. It doesn't say you got to believe anything. Just don't do it. So you're going to walk in faith. All right. One more, and I, and I stop, because we could go all night. I love this topic. I think people have been cheated out of liberty for far too long by demands and commands when we have a Jesus who kept all the demands and the commands, and if we would just follow Jesus, I'm not saying it would be easy, but man, it would be fun, because if you're going to go down, go down with the one that knows how to resurrect. That's my whole theory. I mean, if you're going down, get swallowed in a whale that at least knows how to vomit. Right? I mean, what? just let him bring you to the shore of the other side. And so you're always in safe space with Jesus, even though it's not always easy. You're with Jesus, you'll be all right. The early church got it early. Now they fought over it, but they got it early. And here's what I mean. Here's the last one. This is from the, this is from the council in Jerusalem in Acts 15, 6. The apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. This matter is... Do Gentiles need to follow the law and be circumcised? So they're still fighting over that. When there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, now see, they're really fighting over it. Much dispute. This isn't just some small time issue. This is like dividing. This is a rough one. What are we going to do? Peter said, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth, the Gentiles should, be, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Time out. Good while ago was five chapters ago, by the way. That was Acts chapter 10. When Peter is at Joppa, sitting on the roof, God shows him the unclean animals. He goes to Cornelius' house. Cornelius' house is Italian, not Jewish. They all receive Christ. It shocked Peter that they could receive Christ. By my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. Path-breaking, world-changing. Can't believe those Italians under the Roman Empire who do not know Moses could receive the same Holy Spirit we can. He goes, but I saw it. I heard it. It's real. He goes, so we can stop disputing and fighting about whether they're really saved, right? Now watch this. He doesn't make a distinction between us and them. He purified their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why would we test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither us nor our fathers were able to bear? Look at that phrase. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as that. Do you notice, where, where did Peter get this kind of language in verse 10? Remember Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28? Coming to me, all you labor heavy laden, I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Look what Peter does with that. He goes, why in the world would we test God by putting a yoke on the neck of these people that neither our fathers nor us were able to bear? What yoke is he talking about? The whole argument is, should people be required to keep Moses' law? And Peter stands up and goes, we couldn't even keep Moses' law. And it was a yoke that killed every one of us. So why in the world would we put people back under it? Why am I telling you this? Because when John says, if you love God, keep his commandments, don't jump Jesus to get to Moses. Why would you leave your spouse and go cheat with Moses? This isn't talking about Mosaic law, dietary law, sanitary law, it's talking about the words that come out of Jesus' mouth. You say you love him? Do what Jesus said do. End of story. That was the early church. Well, let's go read about Jesus. Good place to start. Jesus trumps everything else. Jesus is the final word. The center. Keep him there. Don't move him to the side. Keep him there. That's good news. Let's pray. Father... I thank you that the word is so real, so powerful, still moves our heart. Thank you that the burden, the yoke is easy and the burden is light. Thank you that we are not just believing and then left out here. We believe and we follow. 
then we know we are yours because we love the brethren. Father, where we don't love, I think it's because we haven't yet had the love revealed to us. So reveal that through your power, through your spirit. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.